Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of Karen and Toss. This is the podcast last YouTube channel where I your host, Karen and Heist, film critic and journalist, speak to film creators around the world about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today I'm very happy to be joined by writer and director Nicole Chi and, comp- and p- composer Diego Rojas to talk about their film Los Mochi. Los Mosquitos, I knew it and I knew I said in my head I'm going to mess it up and I did. <laughs> I'll say it again. Los Mosquitos. And it's about these two young girls, Ari and Natalia, who are Honduran immigrants living in the U.S. And they are basically trying to find their way uh, to find a connection to each other because they're not sisters. You know, they're they're not related by blood. So they're trying to learn what family means to them. And they have a caretaker, Magda, who is trying to be the adult trying to be the caretaker but natalia being the recalcitrant teenager she is is kind of rebelling against that but first of all thank you nicole and Diego first come for joining me to talk about the film thank you so much Jane. oh thank you so much for having us we're like really really excited to chat with you and i think it's the first time that we have like a dual like interview diego and i so we really appreciate that space yeah able to talk about the like the music yeah, too <laughs> no for sure i very usually if i can i try to get the directors like the producers or the writers or cinematographers but it happens very rarely that i'm able to get the director and someone else i'm very happy that diego is able to join me and um I, and like it's very rare for me so i do cherish this <laughs> um so, so the first question i have to ask um for you nicole um you're 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 costa rican by birth and you but the film is about two honduran girls why did you choose like two why did you choose two girls from of honduran nationality versus like costa rican nationality to make the film about so um i i i this film is shot in austin texas where i currently uh, live and um i've been nurturing a relationship with uh, these women from uh Nonprofit organization that is a domestic workers and nannies led organization um, here in Austin uh, since 2019, since I arrived to Austin. And so through that connection with that organization, I met Magda, which is uh, the, the caretaker in the film. And so um, it's it's more that I wanted to be authentic about the, the family that I had met and that I had researched uh, with. Um, and that I have a relationship with. And, and that's why I wanted to make the film uh, and honor the fact that they come from Honduras and like that specific um, experience that they have. Um, although we're like Central American countries, um, our experiences are different. And definitely for me as a Costa Rican that comes to the US, um, I come with a di- in a different way, right? Like my migration process is completely different. But I do think that uh, culturally, uh, Honduras and Costa Ricans have a lot of uh, similarities and so uh, when I met I've, there's a lot of Mexicans in Texas but I felt like a special bond with the Hondurans because we are more much more similar in a lot of ways I, I was born and I was raised in Costa Rica I lived my whole life there so I very much identify as a Costa Rican and a Latina and so um, it was more of a choice of, of of being truth to the people that I had met and that I wanted to work with uh, to make the film about to, about the Honduran family. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's interesting that you that you did do that because and I think it's and I think it's special that you did that because this is the family that you met and you created as an immigrant and like I myself and I'm an immigrant and from Barbados. I talk about this a lot, but I can't ignore it because it's just part of my identity. I'm Barbadian and I, I've been living in Toronto since 2009 with my twin sister and the thing that really does help you to survive as an immigrant anywhere is forming community you know and it can and like the people that i formed community with were people from the caribbean not from the same island but from different islands across the caribbean but also people from like east and west africa and you know and even some people from western europe and and eastern europe and and like community is how you're able to survive as an immigrant so i think it's important that you did that when you made the film that you focused on a community that you felt connected with, you know, and that, and that it helped to form a bond with them in order to make the film because you had them basically playing themselves, you know, you had, mm-hmm. I'll pull up their names. Now you have uh, Magdalena Alvarez who plays Magda, the caretaker. And then there's Natalia Rodriguez and Abigail Hernandez 
And these are uh, a grown woman, like Magda's, I'm assuming, like in her 40s, and Abigail and Natalia are two different ages. Um, Abby is a teenager, you know, around 16, 17, and Natalia, she's uh, she's younger, like 10, 11. And you have all of these, you have these three different generations of stories to tell, you know. So talk to me about that, about developing a story about three generations of Honduran women, because they're each at different places in their lives, you know. So how did you get them to come together and say, I want to make a story about the three of you? So actually, they all, um, at the time that I met, I first met Magda, um, and I was very close friends with her, and I started, um, she invited me uh, to her family gatherings. And that's how I kind of started uh, to get in touch more with like the rest of the Honduran community in Austin. And, but specifically, um, a few months, uh, I'm sorry, a year after I met Magda, um, Abby arrived to the US and they were living together. Um, and then a few months after that, Nata arrived. And so it was actually the dynamic uh, of the film in a way. Um, and that is a dynamic that keeps changing also because uh, Magda has other family members and sometimes they uh, live with the, those other family members and it's like a changing, a, a constant change for them um, out of need and out of necessity, of course. Um, and so for me, I, I, I felt there was a, a special bond between them and I felt like there was a, a lot of heart in, in, in Magda, Magda's family and Magda's uh, actual daughter also, who is like uh, Abby's official caretaker like in reality. And so um, I, as soon as I met uh, Abby, I was fascinated by her. I thought like uh, she was, she, she, she is actually very shy. Um, but I had like these very interesting conversations with her and she would talk about her aspirations and like how she felt in the US. Um, and I, and similar to Magda also, she talked a lot about her experiences. And so understanding that they wanted to talk about how they were feeling and how their lives were here kind of really inspired me and kind of uh, pushed me in that direction because I felt like they wanted to talk about these experiences. Um, and then Nata was just incredible. Uh, she, uh, I, I developed the script as I was getting to know them. And so originally I was thinking it was going to be more just Magda and Abby, but Nata was always there. And like uh, when I interviewed them, uh, sometimes I brought a camera and then she would play with the camera and it kind of just organically became a she became part of the story also because she had just arrived to the u.s so like kind of her um her experiences were like what she was living at the moment and abby had already been here for a little while so she had already kind of uh digested a little bit more her assimilation process and then of course magda who has years of being here is like much more assimilated to uh here so i think like it's a three generations of women that arrive at different times and that have uh, assimilated different uh, like uh, at a different pace in a way uh to 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 life in the u.s mm -hmm. and for you diego um how did you become involved with the project with nicole like what was that process like for you and how did meeting these three characters, these three um, people like Magda, Nata, and Abby inspire you with the sound of the film? Because it has, because like again, there are three generations, so like the sound of the film has to not only fit the characters but fit the aesthetic and the look that Nicole wanted for the film. Yeah. Um, so to answer your first question, we actually, uh, we actually, what. Uh, this is gonna sound funny, but we've never, we've never actually met each other, like personally. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all, like all our collaborations have been remotely. Do you not live and, in Austin? Uh, no, no, I live in Quebec. Really? I am in yeah. Toronto. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah, that's insane. I was like, oh, yeah. okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, we've never actually met. But um, how I came to be a part of this project was because um, we had collaborated in another project of Nico's, Nicole's. Uh, it's a, it was a feature length film. I don't know if you guys had spoken about this before I came in, but uh, it, no. it was uh, so it's this uh, feature length uh, documentary of hers called Yan. 
And so we collaborated on that. And, you know, there was, you know, this, this report and this uh, vibe, uh, this energy that, that we, uh, you know, we, we experienced uh, being afar. And so we thought, well, she came to me, she approached me, uh, if, correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, not uh, being accurate here, but uh, uh, so she approached me, I think late, was it last year or two years it ago? Was, it was two years ago, like two a, years ago, a yeah. of the year, because I was writing. And yeah. I had already worked with Diego and I loved working with him. I was like, oh my God, I'm in the writing process and I wanted to, as I was writing, I wanted to listen to some yeah. of like, the music that we were going to have. Exactly. In yeah. So, so that's, so that was sort of like my initial sort of like end to the project. Uh, and then eventually that evolved uh, into, you know, more things as, as Nico started writing, sending me like drafts, I would send her like ideas, not necessarily, you know, uh, concrete ideas, musical like, motifs and things like that. It was just, um, you know, things that would get us both uh, in, inspired and, and sort of like, yeah, and into the mood of uh, yeah. Of, um, and um and as far as setting a mood i was uh, you know i wasn't necessarily thinking of um sort of like portraying uh something as far as music goes uh for the for the uh, the, the three individual characters mm. if anything i was just more interested in, in setting uh uh more of a sort of like a psychological foundation if that, that makes any sense it kind of does, uh, yeah, yeah. And I was just more interested, uh, interested in, in like, sort of like setting the or feeling the 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 film from the perspective of the two uh, the two girls. Mm. And uh, at some point, I uh, I don't know why I instinctively thought that it would be a good idea to like record myself breathing, and that uh, that idea was something that that Nico really latched onto. Yeah, that was so important, actually. That was like, oh, this is it. Like, that was the moment for us, I feel. That we're like, oh, my God, yeah. this is so important for the the music of the film. And yeah. I think Diego really understood also, like, how there were musical moments, right? Because um, yeah. I've always, I'm, oh, I, I have a little trouble sometimes with uh, films that have a lot of music. And uh, we wanted to be, like, very thoughtful yeah. about the moments. And I love that Diego always respects that. Like he's very much like, oh yeah, like we're gonna do like those specific moments. And I don't know, it's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's 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 also I think that it's a, a a sort of like the material lends itself for a very nuanced approach. If I was if I was like you know instinctually trying to go like more music and oh let's let's have more cues here and there, and I think that would just force feed a, a set of emotions that they're already pretty much there. So I'm just accentuating that, mm -hmm. uh, if anything, yeah. yeah. So so for the process of using the music, so it's interesting that you said you're in Quebec and Nico, you're in Austin, is what was the actual technical process of developing the sound for the film? Because you, you, you were working on the sound while the film was being filmed or did you get it? Or did you get the completed version of the film and then you built the the sound of the film after you got the completed version Do you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so i um so it was interesting because i in this process i asked diego first to to i gave him a draft it was like the first draft it was different from the actual like final film um and oh, I, I gave him a draft of the script and from that he started giving me a mood <laughs> um, and and that helped me a lot like on set because like I, I before i would shoot those specific scenes i would like hear it and like kind of try to imagine um uh, how the it would be um and that helped me my directing uh, but that definitely evolved uh, when we hit the post-production and then we circled back until I had like a, like a, like a finish cut, I want to say. <laughs> yeah, like a more polished uh, cut. And yeah, and that's when like we had more conversations about it, right, Diego? That was yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, there's, there's, 
it, and it's actually something that I appreciate from Rico is that she really got me into this the, this project really early on, and I I really enjoy that because for one, it's really hard to work. I always call it working against temp music. Temp music is sort of like the the sort of like the temp score, the the temporary music to set the mood to inspire the the composer. But what it actually does is actually influences, or I feel like it influences me. Um, and it's really hard to get the the filmmaker sort of like detached from that idea. Hmm. So it, um, it yeah. Well. yeah, I think that happened. Uh, that has happened to me before, and I kind of wanted to like be freed from that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's it's swimming against the current. Yeah. yeah, but I'm I'm here just thinking. How do you? I was gonna ask. How do you build a score? and a song from just a draft but then i just thought when sometimes when i read books i kind of like come up with a sound in my head myself yeah. and it's kind of unintentional and i don't sometimes i don't even notice that i'm doing it so i like i'll think of like a, the something from the book and then i'll think i'll be like oh wait this was a song that i had in my head as yeah. i was reading the book you know and it could be like a random song or like i hum a lot like i do a lot of humming unconsciously and that's what it is or so do i <laughs> <laughs> I, I hum. My sister said, "Is my sister like you're humming?" And I'm like, I don't even know that I'm humming, and yeah. and that's why my dog looks at me very weirdly sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, but I, but yeah, it kind of makes sense now, like how you like this the story can like in influence how and like inspire you to come up with a song, especially yeah. if you're a person that thinks in sound. You know, like yeah, it, exactly. It makes sense. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like thinking of it more as a director. Almost, it sounds weird. Like I'm pretty much sitting on, on Nicole's like uh, seat and for a minute and be like, okay, you know, uh, what would I put in, in in there? And just look like, you know, just letting go, like allowing myself to just experiment and, and throw her ideas. And mm. with that right now we're in a sort of like a relationship dynamic that allows us to sort of like be feel free and uh, pretty, um, uh, well, yeah, feel free, feel flexible enough to just throw ideas to one another and be like, hey, you know, what if we try this? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I appreciate a lot of, of Diego that we were able to, like, I was like, oh, I think that's not the direction, but I feel yeah. free to be able to say that. And he's exactly. also free to be like, mm, maybe this other thing. <laughs> yeah. And I think that comes with time because we already collaborated once. So yeah, but yeah. that's what filmmaking is, right? It's a collaboration and it's about flexibility, you know? And like I always say, like when I've never directed or anything, but I've been on film sets before. I've done like set bits and stuff and I'll see how like the just the way a, an actor changes their tone, changes the entire context and meaning of a line and dialogue. And they have to do it over and over again. So they get the right beat and the sound and then in the post is when they is when the director figures out okay the way they said this line is why i want it delivered and how it fits in to the rest of the scene and then to the broader context like for a tv episode this is the entire episode can change in context and tone based on like just the inflection of the yeah, yeah. performance voice for a specific line so that makes perfect sense for me and and so then in like in in during the process of filming i'm um, nicole when you have like these like like Diego's own own drafts of the sound and like the the score and everything. How does how not that it influences you on set, but like how does that also help you with finding the rhythm of the story throughout the process? Because like you said, the first draft of a script is never the fine is never the finished is never the finished product. You know, it changes and mutates over the course of filming. So how like but having that sound and like that identity really influences the way that you approach a film because i noticed with the film it doesn't have a very the score isn't really there you know like because a lot of the sound is like natural sound like the breathing of the characters like the movement that they make that's a lot that's where a lot of the sound comes from but then when the score does come in especially in the moments where um with abby and natalia closer to the end of the film where like you get like the sense that natalia herself is running from something i get a sense that she's running from she's running away but not from magda but she's running away from whatever circumstance and like possibly the truth that her mother isn't returning and that's where the score comes and really comes in and makes you get the tension that yeah, that's yeah. between these characters and the tension of their histories but then there's like the sense of um 
I guess this word, the word in my head is mystique because like the most, the los mosquitoes in my head, I want to keep saying mosquitoes because that's how we say it with my Bajan dialect. We say mosquitoes, but the los <laughs> mosquitoes in this is, isn't like actual mosquitoes, you know, but it's more of like a memory that they both share, like this memory that they have. Exactly. So that's where the score really kind of informs you. Like it's not the physical mosquitoes that, that are bugging them, but it's actually the thoughts and the memories and the things that they themselves are processing in their heads that are actually the little mosquitoes buzzing around on the inside. So the score kind of gives you that, but like tell me during the filming process, like how did the sound that Diego created really help with like the, the flow and the tone of the film for you? I think it influenced a lot the writing of that, of those scenes where like the score is, and especially towards the end, I think it informed um, the tone that I was aiming for. And it was important for me to understand like the atmosphere of that of that scene, because I think before the music, uh, before that that uh, uh, preliminary music um, that Diego sent, I um, I had a hard time verbalizing the atmosphere of the film. I think it helped me verbalizing it. Um, but it really did come more together in the post-production, like in the edit, like those like editing decisions and how like um, the music kind of builds that moment up um, came more in the edit. I had always imagined that it would be kind of uh, cut in that way, but the rhythm of it really it comes together with the, the editor and Diego's uh, work um, in, in, I, in, 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 on set. Honestly, I only what I did was that I listened to the track um, mm. the the day of the of shooting that specific scene of the end in the night. Um, but other than that, like I I left it until post production to actually continue the work because I knew that the song would change, so I could I didn't want to like hammer it down with like the no. preliminary one that we had. Yeah, right. and and tell me how that actually works in con. Um, conjunction with the cinematography by Carlos Estrada because sound and visual go hand in hand in film, you know, like the sound and the visuals have to match. And for this film, there, I, I, there's like, to me, three different types of visuals for the film, like the way how it looks. Like there's uh, in, the, in the house, like they feel is like natural lighting, you know, it doesn't feel like artificial lighting. It just feels like walking through a house during the day. And that suits the situations they're in because the, all three um three characters, Magda and um Nata and Abby, they're in their natural element, you know, like they're having natural conversations, conversations that don't even really feel scripted. It just feels like you're just there watching them. But then when they're outside in the field, that has more of like almost like not a fairy tale feels way, but it feels more um set apart from everything else, you know. Like this is the this is kind of like a dream like situation, you know, this is where like they're at peace. They're not fighting. They're not bickering. You know, they're just lying in a field surrounded by flowers um, and just like talking. And that has a very different feel to the indoors. And then the scene later at the night for the Thanksgiving dinner, that that's where a lot of the tension comes because like the music is playing, like they're, they're playing like the um, Latin American and Central American music. And like the, there's the pinatas and like it's supposed to be a festive atmosphere and it's like the lights and stuff. But I got the sense that the lights were triggering for uh, for Nata, and they're triggering because the the los mosquitoes that she always that she talks about are more like the lights that we see in our eye when we close our eyes and all like those. I can't remember. I think it's they're like phosphorescent lights. I can't remember the actual term, but like there's the like the term hmm? floaters. They're called floaters. yeah, like the floaters. And but yeah, but there's like there's an actual term for it. But like when you close your eyes, like you see like the different like lines and squiggly dots, and that's what she's talking about. And she associates the those the actual lights from like uh, from the party with that, and that's not a happy memory for her. So like that's where like you really get the sense of tension for for Nada, and it builds from the beginning of the film. It really starts to build up, but that's where it really starts to come, and that's where like the the score really kind of feels feeds into the tension a bit, and but then the cinematography feeds into that as well because the cinematography is like for some of the characters this is like a happy occasion, but for her it's not. So talk about um, the cinematography and the score and mm -hmm. the and the lighting working to, like working together for you to get this these three particular feels of the film. Yeah, I think <clears throat> it was um, it was a very um, 
thoughtful and, and conversations that I had with Carlos. Um, we really wanted to have like, we didn't want to have tension throughout all the film because we don't think that that's how their lives are. Like they have those moments of happiness. They have those moments of ordinary life, but they also have these really deep tensions happening. And so for us, it was like really important to accentuate that through the photography and the lighting. And I'm glad that you uh, are able to talk about like the, the night sequences because those were like the most, most complicated ones. And I think that, uh, um i'm glad that you can feel that tension and like all the the theme of the light um and in conjunction with the music it was a it was wonderful because diego actually was the one that that uh i was talking to him about the music we had another song for the party and he came in like a music supervisor for me and helped me find another uh, music that i felt fit, fit better that atmosphere um but I think like both sound and cinematography kind of come together more in the post-production uh, space. Um, I did feel like tension rising was an important direction that I told both Carlos and uh, Diego. And so like heightening that feeling of like, like she's like, like uh, of being stressed and like just wanting to run away. That was like, um, something that I talk with Carlos in terms of like camera movement mm -hmm. um, and just like being like following uh, Abby and being more more fast, right? Um, but I like the 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 how the music is actually more is the opposite in a way because she's entering that psychological space and i think diego and i talked a lot about the psychological space and i talked a lot with carlos about how the psychological space needed to feel different uh, from the ordinary life and that is why the ordinary life doesn't have a score mm -hmm. the only moment that it has some score is in the bathroom because she closes her eyes and it's she's kind of entering that space and that's why we have that and so the separation of those moments um come both from the cinematography and the sound uh, uh, together. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned that Diego suggested a different song. What was, why did you change? Why did you suggest a different song to what she had originally for the, uh, for the party sequence? It was, it, was me. it was me. It was me. I was like, Diego, I don't know. I feel something off with mm -hmm. this. And I, Diego is really good at kind of understanding me because I, I'm not a musical person. Like, I don't know anything about instruments. I've never been able to play anything in my life. Uh, so I can't really talk in musical terms. And so I just talk about my emotion. With <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I told you about it. Um, I don't know if you <laughs> so you're talking about the uh the scene at the party at the party like the song like the cool yeah, <laughs> that, well, yeah why, that's, say, I, why, I, why was what was it about the particular song that ended up in the film that you thought would be a better fit so so, so okay so that wasn't a uh a song that i had uh it was a, a diegetic piece that was in there and i don't generally like write diegetic um music pieces uh so yeah she came into me like one random day she's like oh you know this isn't working here and so i was <laughs> like okay well you know, let's let's try and <laughs> do a little research and i found out this band that was ba based in austin and who happened to be in uh, the festival at south by southwest as well and i was like wow okay well then, you know this could be interesting let's see uh, if, if uh so i sent you know nicole that link and, and she made yeah. you know just it was magical contact. it was magical because like i had another song and it just had like a different vibe but when yeah. he said el combo oscuro is the name of the band and i was like oh wow what is this because for me it was very important that the, the diegetic music party uh, had the, the had the vocals and i did a super small film i can't I can't make a song for this and I also don't have budget to get like a very famous song. So um, Diego was incredible to just do this research and he really quickly found it. And I was like, oh my God, and I started listening to these options and I'm like, oh, this is it. And they were incredible at Combo Scooter. They were so nice to um, allow us to feature the song in, in that film. But I, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's a happy cumbia, but it has like a, 
something mm. that uh, kind of really fit in into that tense atmosphere in Abby's head. I feel right. Like. So, <laughs> so talk, so talk about the this 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 atmosphere in Abby's head because like they're saying like the to me the mosquitoes are <laughs> mosquitoes uh, <laughs> are are <laughs> memories that she's running from like the reality of her mom not um coming back you know and i think for her and that's the thing she's running from from nada that's why she's so abrasive with nada and it's not that she doesn't like nada or whatever it's just that every time nada talks she's talking about her mom like has my mom responded has my mom you know said something and Nat and abby doesn't want to say anything not because she doesn't want to tell um nada i think it's because she herself didn't want to acknowledge that her own mom wasn't responding, you know, that her own mom hasn't said anything to her since she's been there. So talk about the headspace of, of Nada and um, her not, not coming to the realization, but getting, I guess you could say the courage to acknowledge it to, um, to not Nada, sorry, the, the, um, for Abby to get, um, getting the courage to acknowledge it out loud to Nada and working with, um, the act with Natalia to do that, because like this, I would assume this is their first, this is their first acting roles, right? And they all three did such, I think, really good jobs with these performances. So talk to me about working with her and like getting and getting her in the headspace of the character of Nada. Yeah, I think I I do you mean Nata or Abby? I'm like a teenager or Abby. I keep saying Nata, but I mean Abby, sorry. Okay, Abby. So it was really wonderful to to work with them. Um but I, it was a challenge for me as a director um, because I really wanted to be um, respectful of like their actual experiences. Um, it, it, like the film is informed by some of their experiences. Um, and I always approach it as like, this is a fictionalized version of yourselves. And the only reason why they call each other their actual names is because they couldn't not, like, I tried to have them and like, we did a lot of rehearsals where they were calling themselves different names. Um, uh, but they would get really confused by it. They just were not used to it. Um, but I created a lot of, um, rituals for them to distance themselves, their actual selves from the character that they were portraying. And so like, I would give them, um, accessories that were just the characters. And like every time, whether it was rehearsal or it was on set, we would do like invoke the character. And it, it was kind of like a weird thing, but like we would do that so that we would enter the character. And at the end of the day, we would let the character go we would remove that and we would be like oh now i'm abby my normal self and all of this and so um those kind of limit the like uh putting the limit between the character and their lives was very important um in particular with abby because she was doing the most i think emotional mm -hmm. uh, uh, role in a way um and in particular that scene at the very end when she acknowledges it was I know that it was very difficult for her and we talked a lot about um that moment um and I know and I think like uh, I I knew that uh as a director I could have I had the power to like even push it farther and make her like cry or something but I didn't want to do that because I think like um there was it was not necessary to to push uh her experience in that way. I, I thought that wouldn't be right for me. And we did that scene just like two or three times. That was it because I didn't want to continue going to that. And we had like a lot of, uh, I talked a lot with my producers and my assistant, the director to be able to make a schedule that would, uh, would be respectful of this experience and be like, okay, when we finish, when we can never finish the, the day of set with a sad emotion on them. Mm -hmm. And so it was like beginning of the day, we do this thing and then we just change it. And I, we had to make the mood of the set like happy because I could not let them go home feeling those emotions it's like that. I thought would be irresponsible of me as a director, especially because I know, I know them. Um, but I think like, it was very brave, I think of the three of them, uh, of the, all of them 
to uh, expose themselves in the way that they did uh, in the film and like to put their heart in it. Um, I'm just really happy that they, they've been able to come to the festival and like see the film and share it with audiences and just uh, uh, talk more about their experiences. And that has been like really fulfilling um, for us. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, maybe. you did because, <laughs> um, no, because you did because they are young um, performers and even from Magda, like who's older, like being happy and for first time performers, ha giving them a tool, like a little a physical tool to distance themselves from the characters is important because it helps them to let it go at the end of the day and not internalize it and just remember this yeah. is a character yeah there may be similarities to my own experience but this is not who i am this is not me you know and it's a good way to distance themselves from everything you know and and that's the and and i think as a because you're very young being able to recognize that that's something that you as a director needs to do is very important and i wish more mature and older and veteran directors would do it because that's how you get like actual veteran performers talking about oh method acting like you do yeah. not need to method act to play a specific character let, let that go why are you holding on to an accent and you're talking to someone on the street you are not stop it you know so like and it, so i think it's very good that you did that and it's very um and it's very thoughtful and it shows a lot of foresight for you as a as not only as a director but someone who is close to them to know that i need to make sure that they don't hold on to this character longer than necessary as soon as you call a cut that's it you know and they don't take it home with them afterwards because in because it not only helps them separate themselves from their characters but it helps them separate each other from the characters because i just said like it was harder for them to not call each other by their given name so that that would have created an extra had you not do that it would have made it difficult I think for them to let the characters go. So I think that's, I think that's a very ingenious and a very thoughtful and considerate thing to do. So I'll see you for that. Ah. And, like, <laughs> and, and, and so something else that I wanted, you mentioned it earlier, um, assimilation. So that's interesting because for me as an immigrant, something I always talk about is the difference between assimilation and integration. And I see, and to me, assimilation is when you just fully invest in the in the adopted culture like you don't want to like wear like your traditional dress you don't want to listen to traditional music anything you're like this is fully me like using an american like i'm american and like therefore i have to shed everything of my past yeah. let it go whereas i see integration as like yes i'm an american citizen now but that doesn't mean i have to let go of my cultural identity you know i, I, I don't have to let go of my cultural practices and 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 who i am like i am a canadian citizen I, i've had citizenship even before i moved here and I say, I'm a Canadian citizen, I'm a Canadian citizen. I saw my passport and I flash it. I'm very proudly because that has more power than a Barbadian passport. But I still call myself a Barbadian, you know, like I'm still a Bajan and like, I still like speak in my natural dialect and everything. Um, and I, I said, I'm not gonna let go of that culture. So I always look at the difference between assimilation and integration. And your film kind of touches on that because like for Magda, she, like you said it earlier, she's assimilated cause she's like talking about th celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, whereas um and 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 Abby tells her, uh, I don't want to be celebrating. Why are we celebrating <laughs> Thanksgiving? You know, and she's like basically saying like we are indigenous people. Why are you celebrating the the colonizers Thanksgiving <laughs> kind of thing? And I thought that was a very interesting scene because like, it's been a very big discussion for, in the last few years, in particular, especially here in Canada, where you have thanksgiving and a lot of people that are indigenous or immigrants don't celebrate thanksgiving um the traditional way you know like we and my family and my friends who are all immigrants we when we get together we don't really celebrate it as traditional thanksgiving yeah. but we just as the way to get to we just like we we're like this is a bank holiday and it's a way as a day off from work so we're gathering together to eat you know so, but we don't really acknowledge it as thanksgiving but for magda she's seeing it as thanksgiving so i want you to talk about that and like they how um Abby, Abby is struggling with Magda trying to get her to assimilate and Abby's like I don't want to assimilate you know I just want to be me you know exactly I think and I think that's an actual like real struggle for any um immigrant especially when they come in at a young age and there's like that parent figure that is trying to get them to like really fit into the school really like just speak English now like <laughs> you know all of these um Tensions. And I could see it um, in her family, how like there's also younger children that 
they no longer speak Spanish, for example. And so like, um, I could, I really felt like more than, I think like more than assimilation is that, uh, especially for Thanksgiving, it's like they have appropriated themselves of the space they are in. And so they have this wonderful mix. Like, yes, it's Thanksgiving, but we have the piñata and we're going to have the tamales, but maybe we also want to eat the turkey. And like, I feel like that's wonderful. And that's how they do it. Like they just kind of take what um, is is good for them. And like, they make this mix because uh, of course, uh, when they have a family gathering, it's all kinds of different levels of assimilation or appropriation of the space or integration, right? Like all of them are different. So one of them will bring the turkey because they are at that stage of like their uh, their their migration process in a way. Um, and another one would be like, no, I just want to eat these these tamales. Or there would be Mexicans in the party and they would bring their tacos and like you know. So it's it's that mixture i really really wanted to portray through that party in particular um because i think like that is kind of the essential experience of an immigrant in the u.s when they gather together in community and like they share that it's like having their little island of like that is who where we come from you know and and you kind of are, feel transported like to a different space and so for me, the party was the hardest thing to shoot, but it was uh, really important for the film. Yeah. And, and your own experience being an immigrant from Costa Rica, like that, how did that inform you personally as a director? Because like, yes, you're showing like the Honduran version of their, of Thanksgiving there. Like for my own family, like when we have the, like we do like the Canadian Thanksgiving, which is a different day to the U.S. Thanksgiving is we our turkey is smoked turkey. We, we like, you know, we eat like, uh, and then, and then <laughs> we will have like our traditional Bajan like uh, meals for that. You know, that's, we, we, that's how we use it. You know, we uh, use our traditional Bajan food, but for you, um, for having your own experience as an immigrant, like, I think that also helped you to understand, um, this neat, um, Abby and Nata and Magda needing to separate from their characters, um, from, from who they are, because that like, you yourself, as a director, I have to be able to separate your own personal feelings from the act of a director. You know, you're like, I need you to do this. You know, and like, I like outside of being a director, you probably wouldn't ask them to do to do what needs to be done. Like the scene where um, Magda pushes like um, Abby against the wall. You know, and like that's about showing like the um the tension in their relationship and um Magda just needing Abby to just like cooperate with her on this one thing. But on the outside, outside of being a director, you wouldn't like want them to do something like that but for you like your how how was your own experiences helped you with like making this story about female um i think female immigrants because i think the experiences of men and women are very different in certain circumstances especially because this film i think deals with motherhood and like yeah. relationships between a daughter and absent mother like their mother isn't there but their mothers aren't there but they're still like functioning as daughters I think like for me um the immigrant experience is very very important that because it informs like how I view like the world and I kind of like observe like how like, how our experiences are different and like in particular like the party and kind of a uh, a uh, the thanksgiving part it's like something that i've lived with like the time that i've lived in the u.s at this point it's like i have never eaten turkey because all my friends are like from different parts of the world so when we do thanksgiving it's just like a gathering to be to hang out anything, you know and we, and we, yeah yeah we, first <laughs> turkey, right? yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah we do like a potluck and we just like bringing like all our countries different uh, foods and that that's how we do it and so like that kind of also inspired a lot like that a scene of the movie but i think that um beyond the immigration part is i wanted to talk about motherhood too and like family and which is like a very universal experience whether you've migrated or not um and so uh, that scene where she pushes the mother is like the tensions that arise whether Magda is her 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 blood related mother or not she is the mother figure in that yeah. relationship <laughs> And she loves Abby and like she she brought her 
uh, with difficulty to the U.S. and all of these like hardship, and she wants the best for her child, and that is a rising tension, right, in the relationship because they don't see eye to eye about what is the right way to go about things in her youth, you know, as a teenager, um, and I think that's a constant struggle whether you are a migrant or not, like. As a teenager, you'll have that with your parents. And so I think I wanted to tap into those universal uh, experiences of being, um, of being, of having, of like having a, a parent, you know, and that parent figure. Um, and so we tried to explore that um, in that way. Magda having several children and Abby also like having these different mother figures throughout her experience being in, in the U.S., yeah. yeah, and she also has like um not that they're acting like the busybody little sister. I thankfully have never had a little sister because I have a twin sister with the same name. <laughs> but I imagine if I but then again, you know what we fight like older and younger sisters anyway. Like we still argue and we argue over clothing, shoes, or um <laughs> like music, playing music and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, but so you got those relationships done, and like you talked about your um like that as inspiration for you, Diego. Like for what. As a as a composer, what do you really look look to that inspires you? Like, is there like a particular instrument, a particular song, um, mm -hmm. a particular memory that you have that really um, that when you're maybe struggling with coming up with a composition that you go back to and you say like this is it helps you to reset and recalibrate and like really refocus when you need to. Yeah, the, this particular th th this particular project was kind of special in a way that. Like I said before, I wasn't really tapping onto my own musician sort of mind. I was going to more like a psychologist almost. Like I was just, you know, how does it feel to... It's it's funny that you mentioned memory because that's exactly how I interpreted... It. Initially, the, the title of the film was Floaters. Mm, and okay. uh, and every time, every I don't know if I should have <laughs> disclosed that, Nico, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, so I initially to, for me it was a, it was more about the representation of memories and, and how it felt for me to sort of like you know this concept of having a mother that I'm that I'm not I'm no longer be able to see right now. Um, how does it? How do I carry her in my? Memories? How do I see her? what does it mean to for me to hold on to this you know now concept that i'm not aware of anymore yeah. you know um and so i actually sent a, a short snippet of a uh uh it was like a synthesizer mm -hmm. motif that i sent through a tape loop and and that went on and on and on and on and it was inspired on this basic concept of memory um, that it's it's if you hear it, it it actually goes on into the, in the in that scene of I think it was Abby running away, and when she like sort of like finds herself, she's able to hear this memory of herself, whatever that may mean for her, uh, and that's when the actual motif comes in, um, and it's just just very fragmented. Uh, motif that is not it has no coherence musically but you know then again it's like if you look into your past into your memories uh, is there any coherence to them as well or, mm -hmm. or is, is there a string to the occurrences that happen in our past in the way that, I, that we perceive them do they have any uh, you know um, sort of like a uh, episodic element to them uh yeah so it was yeah it was just mostly about that tapping onto that um much much more than okay you know i want this particular instrument into uh this specific scene um yeah it was more fun than the concept in general yeah because uh, memories memory changes and our concept of our memories changes like you know one day we'd have um a particular feeling about a memory and you might have like a I don't know, I think it's because of how my brain functions. Like, to me, memory has a physical sensation in my brain. And, like, you might have, like, a particular emotion attached to memory. Then, like, maybe, like, a few weeks later, you'll think about it and you don't have any physical um, attachment to it. You're, like, you know, you know, it might not be 
as resonant in your mind at that time. But I wanted, I did want to ask you, this is something I, I, I've always wanted to ask a composer. If you had to have a soundtrack for your life, and I know it's like, I know it's like a typical, it was like a passing question, but I've always wanted to ask this. If you, if you could have a, a not necessarily even a soundtrack, but if you, if there was a particular instrument or song that you could use um, to put to a film about your life, about your experiences, what would it be? Okay. So this is just probably going to sound opportunistic, but today is the release of my debut album. Uh, yeah, so it came, came out today. Yeah, and uh, not not saying that that's like soundtrack of my life. Um, mm -hmm. I can't I can't really say that I have a, a, a song or a piece of music that represents me. Um, but I don't know if if anything I could if 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 I could say anything about you know that could sort of like. Uh, be correlated to music and my process as a composer is, uh, you know, the process of, of, of memory that really imbues my my work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very much into that right now. Uh, now that I'm also sort of like making little strides towards writing on my own, like actually writing yeah. uh, story, like, you know, screenplays and stuff. I'm very much interested in exploring that. Um, and not so much, yeah, in my own past, but you know that of my family, and uh, yeah, I just get kind of steered away from what you're. No, what like you're, you, I'm, I'm you sure, know. like writing, like you have, like you're when you're writing, play like particular types of music, right? Like when you're like to help with the yeah. writing process and creative process. And I don't. You, I don't. It's, it's funny. I don't actually hear that because 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 I feel like it's just. See when like yeah, if I've worked with other filmmakers in the past, and they're like, okay, you know, here you go. This is sort of like what we're aiming for, and that mm. immediately it's a oof. You know, I don't know, I don't know if I feel like I want to compete against that. Mm. Um, is I'm if we're you know sort of like striving towards something original, you kind of have to like detach yourself from your influences, yeah. and um, not that I'm I'm not saying that I enjoy the works of I don't know Max <laughs> Richter and you know make out Levi or whatever. But, yeah, yeah. 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 And for and for you, Nico, I know you have to go to so this is gonna be my last question for you. Well if you had a song for the those mosquitoes in your life, in your brain, <laughs> the floaters in your brain, what would it be? Oh my god, I have no idea. I'm so bad with these kind of musical questions. I feel like I do remember that at one point of our conversation, Diego and I were talking about these very like it was Ryuji Sakamoto with someone or something like that. And that was very key for like Los Mosquitos. And personally, I really like Ryuji Sakamoto. So maybe Ryuji Sakamoto, but that's like so many music, mm. like so many different kinds of music. So yeah, but yeah. I'm, I'm bad with this question. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay. It was, it was a pretty sad question. That's fine. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, again, thank you so much to the both of you for joining me to talk about the film. I'm so glad to get both of your perspectives on the filmmaking process because, as I said, it's not you. It's not often that I get to both the, both the director and the composer. So thank you so much for joining me and for making the film because it's really I having the whole Los Mosquitos as a I think as a metaphor for memory and and emotions and emotions attached to memory. I think is really interesting and like you don't and i love the way you did it because you don't realize what it means until the end of the film and then that's when it was i thought i was like okay so this is what it is and i and i think you did such a, i think you both did a fantastic job with the film and for you nicole especially like what you said about the way you worked on set that's really impressive to me so i applaud you honestly mm -hmm. for that because i've had i've heard experiences from actors and i'm just like that would have been that situation would have worked so much better if they had the filmmakers had done something as simple as like say this is what all you need to do is to let it yeah. go right so like apl applause to you for that <laughs> thank you no thank you so much for having us we had a great time and like really appreciate like being able to talk together about the film and the music <laughs> yeah. okay, thank you thank so you. much both thank of you, you and have a good day and stay safe <laughs> yeah. you too Bye.